this is like the central interest of my whole life is like what images draw people in and what images don't. It was about a year ago during COVID lockdown when I happened to pull a random card from a tarot deck. The drawing and the words in the card immediately stirred me, so much so that I sought out the artist. Her name is Kim Kranz. The drawing on the card I pulled was hers, but so were all the others. She had created the whole deck. The descriptive words, artist, teacher, and musician usually attributed to Kim, although true, are too small, in my opinion, to describe her and her work. Kim's life and art are inextricably linked to life force, to Shakti, energy, and flow state. There's a palatable raw and wildness felt in her words. I believe Kim holds a rarely found knowledge about truth and vulnerability, that it can be found by bravely looking in the shadows within ourselves. Our journeys are all different but similar in that much is not seen, much is so easily overlooked. I hope this conversation can serve as a reminder, an invitation to take a moment now, a breath, and to consider the extraordinary, almost miraculous intelligence found not just in our art making, but in our lives as well. Click on podcasts at arttolife.com to find images of Kim's drawings, social links, and sources for her tarot decks, books, and other offerings. Kim joins me now from Los Angeles, California. Welcome to Art to Life, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. So Kim, super appreciate you taking time to talk with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. It's great to be here. You're an artist, you're a recording artist and all kinds of things. But I mean, how you, how many people know you and how I actually discovered you was through your illustrated tarot deck. Yeah, that is the thing that became sort of the salient feature or, or product or thing that people know me by. And a lot of people describe me as a tarot artist, but as we were just saying before you hit the record button, so to speak, that I was in a band back in the day and making, I was actually making 12 foot by six foot drawings and showing in galleries in New York. And that was really what I thought my life was going to be is making music, playing in a band, touring and making these really large scale, very mysterious a collage drawings. And then it turns out I, you know, drew the tarot deck and that really became this central, in a lot of ways, it's still kind of like the central pivoting point of my whole life. Like a lot of my work and my business and my revenue and my, the, all the circuitry of my life spins around, around the, that deck. And it's been wild. And now that the alchemy deck is coming out, the fourth and final of the series of Wild Unknown decks, it allows me to get back to some of these other projects and these other loves of mine. So um, I'm out here in Los Angeles now, having just completed recording a new album that will be out hopefully later this year or early next year. Okay, so there's so much to dive into here. But I, the tarot deck, what I love about it, I mean, you've created a tool for people to navigate, <laughs> you know, by, you know, it, it, it's a diagnostic tool. Did you see it that way? I mean, was this just an interest of yours? And then, I mean, why? Why do you think that this was so magnetic? It's a great question. I think because of my earnest, lifelong interest and pursuit of understanding the power of image and the power of word and symbol. So the tarot deck is really based on the pairing of image and concept. There's a drawing and then there's a word below. And then each of those things has their own meaning and you pair them together and the, the imagination can really jump and yes. go into these broad spaces and very specific spaces. The memory is activated. The emotions are activated. 
it's very, it's like a psycho, psychoactivating, uh, system really. And it, it does that in such a brilliant way and such a universal, timeless mm-hmm. way. And so that is just like the prime <laughs> creme de la creme for an artist. And when I was drawing it, I kept thinking every artist in the whole world you know, I hate to use the word should, but like should draw the tarot deck at some time because it's such an amazing exercise. Yeah. I love assignments. I love assignments with very kind of rigid scopes. And so I felt like I had this assignment. I couldn't find a deck that I liked. I really wanted to start using the cards. And so I gave myself an assignment, draw your own deck and research and research and draw and see what images want to belong to this system of, uh, of images within the deck. I love that what you're talking about where you put a, you take a word and we all know words, it's our language. And then you put it with another communication, an image and the combination of those two, the juxtaposition of those two are far greater I mean, there's literal, you know, association, and then there's just mysterious connection. And it's so good. It just opens the door for inquiry, but it makes it personal. Like I look at your cards and I know where I go is, it's unique to me. And that's the value, I think. But I, I love, I too, I was an illustrator for many, many years and I, I love, you know, the words and and then putting an image to it and the best the best work was when an art director understood what we're talking about right now that you don't want someone to like illustrate what the article is you want them to add meaning and depth to what is also being there so the combination of those two become far far greater most art directors i mean i i struggled with that i eventually left illustration because i didn't get those assignments very often, but I love that you took that on as an assignment. I mean, I think you're right. I I would love to do my own deck. That's so cool. Yeah, there's so much power in the the suggested direction, but the open ended nature of pairing image and word. And I think if you look at really successful advertising or really successful you know, anything, they often have the pairing of those two things in a way that cannot quite be pinned down. Otherwise we get into the territory of something being like a stop sign. If you pair a red octagon with the word stop, we're not going to talk about that for an hour because we know it just, it means this singular thing. Yes. And that's like what Jung would call a, a sign versus a symbol. And a symbol has this generative, mysterious, ever giving in a way, open ended way of just, um, never completing itself, never being pinned downable. And that's really the tarot deck in a nutshell. In your drawings, the large drawings that you were saying you were doing in New York and these, tell me about what are you chasing in those? What is it, what do they feel like? You know, it, was it related to this? Just sort of like, were they inquiry or what were they? They were landscape based, but they were basically drawings of like portal spaces so spaces in the earth or spaces in the sky or like altar spaces that, that have a certain compelling energy. And no matter what I've made over the years, there's this consistent interest in like a force field of energy and how that can draw a person in and uh, lead them into their own door or their own landscape, so to speak. So I can see the link. But I don't know if others could necessarily. Yeah, no, I'm sure there. I'm sure there is. So when you speak of that, I'm just curious. When you speak of you know a portal or the energy, and it draws people in, it's like they, you know, like I teach, I help artists, and one of the things that helps a lot is getting people in their energy, in their juice, and. And that is like a business plan because when people can feel that, I mean, it's hard to describe, it's hard to teach somebody, but you know it when you see it and uh, you can experience it in someone's art. When others feel that, they're drawn to it. And so it's exactly what you're describing. I don't know necessarily why that is, you know, but I think it has something to do with the 
we can recognize ourselves in it and it and we want that maybe I, i'm not sure I mean, this is like the central interest of my whole life is like what <laughs> images draw people in and what images don't. Yeah, I love it. What is the nature of the, I mean, Jung called it the compelling image. I think it was mm -hmm. him. It might have been Hellman, but I think let's just say it was Jung that said there's something about an image that is, you know, often they came in dreams. Dreams are filled with compelling images. They're, they're images that we can neither resolve fully nor dismiss or ignore. Like we don't get tired of them. They keep coming back because they have some sort of, and you could say like generative energy. Yes. And yes. we're attracted to generative energy because we want to. We want feel, that life force. It's yeah, life we want force. the life force. It's Shakti. It's, it, yeah. Exactly. It's yes. Shakti in visual form. And my first ah. draw, drawing teacher, when I was like 15, trained me to observe Shakti. She didn't use that word, but looking back, she would have me look at a drawing of Degas or Mary Cassatt and say, point to the area in the drawing that's most vital and alive. Where is the line alive? Wow. And where is the line she would use the word like dead. Where, where was the artist so tense and worried that there's no life force in the line? So I was like 15 being like, what the F? I don't even know. I'm just looking at this drawing of like a ballet dancer being like, I, it seems cool. And by her, her feet are drawn really well, you know, mm -hmm. but, but then I started to develop a sensitivity to what she was talking about over the years of working with her. I feel I can look at artwork now and say, there's vitality here and there's stress and tension here. There's nervousness here. There's wildness here. There's mm. a, a boredom or confusion here where the person gets really tight. Like when people draw eyes and hands, they get very nervous <laughs> yeah. and they get out of the flow state. There's right, nothing that's right. going to kill a flow state, like trying to draw someone's pupils from like yes. a weird angle. Yes, yes. Oh, I love that. Yes. This is my, that's my background. And that's the kind of awareness I tried to bring into the deck when I drew it. And I think her wisdom is really translated into all the work that I do. Just simply trying to embed the images with a certain vitality that's, that's generative, that keeps giving, not necessarily information, but experience and sensation and you know, I first came across what you're talking about. Um, I had a, I had gone to art school, and I, I was really frustrated because I was pretty excited about art making and illustration when I gave myself my own assignments, kind of like you. But I wasn't very good at being told what to do because the the, the things weren't. I wasn't given that kind of art direction. I didn't have the freedom. So I left on this big, long trip and um, my girlfriend and I, we were gone for a year. And I mean, I was painting realistically, kind of like a loose kind of impressionistic style. Like that's what I did. You know, I kind of learned to draw and paint. But on this trip going all, it was, a, we bought round the world plane tickets and it was all through Southeast Asia and India and the Him Himalaya and, uh, you know, just Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific. And I started to see the same kinds of art, you know, imagery, like certain symbols, certain, there, there was definitely a potency about, you know, a figurine that I saw or a, a wall that's like from the 15th century in Indonesia that related to some, to a Maori figure or, you know, and it's like, wow, what, these are amazing. And I completely abandoned realism. And I started to stylize realism. I started to make up my own images. That was sort of a commercial hack because it gave me freedom to, to draw things. No one could say, oh, well, draw the bank and make it look realistic. I, I was more of an idea person then. I was coming up with, I was communicating ideas, but I was using these symbols. And, but it was like, it was totally that. It was understanding what these images there's certain there's a potency about certain ones and you know when i'm self-conscious and when i'm trying too hard 
you could feel it in the work, you know? And then there's just, it's so interesting. You could just literally look at a picture and tell the big problem or a problem I see a lot is too much of the artist is in it. I don't know if that makes sense. Like you could just feel them. They're just white knuckling it, you know? Yeah, this is a huge piece of the puzzle around being an artist now is how much am I in the work? How much Mm -hmm. of the work is is a, how much do I need to be seen and recognized through the work? This was really distinct, a distinct shift for me when I worked at the Guggenheim Museum as an art handler for years, hanging artwork of big, Uh, you know, all the big stars. Wow. What an experience. Oh my God. The Rothko of the Rothkos is like, you know, we're, we're hanging the thing and it's a Rothko and everyone knows it is a Rothko. This one man made this thing. And so that was how I understood art, really important art is made by someone with a name that people recognize. And then I started working at the Rubin Museum of Art, which is all art at the, from the Himalayas. The monks would fly over from Tibet or Nepal or what have you, Bhutan, and they would bring the sculptures of the deities over and pray with them in the morning because they, they believe and understand or have experienced that God is inside of these sculptures. It's not a sculpture of Lakshmi. It's Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't like drape fabric over them at the end of the day and like go to lunch or whatever. They were like, no, no, you can't do that. You can't leave them in the cart, you know, unattended (laughs) while you go to lunch. (laughs) That's God. And I was, this was a total mind meld for me. And also, but most importantly, the art is anonymous. There's no names attached to any of those mandala paintings, any of those Tonka paintings, any of the sculptures. They were made by people studying and praying and being, you know, bowing down to those deities. So those two models are so different. It's the same with like a sand painting where you blow the thing yes, away. And yes, yes. There's no Instagram handle of the artist of those works, you know? Right, right. So I have become interested in how much can I disappear in my work, mm-hmm. even though I know it's coming through a completely personal positioning, very specific privileged place that I come from. But how much can I allow this other force, whatever it is, to be the author with me. Yes. I've found that that those works are what people are most magnetized to. Yes. And it it gives back to them. And it allows me to continue on and do my next work, too. Following the energy or how I describe it, you know, for myself and in my programs and in teaching is, you know, what brings you alive? Well, you know, you can just feel it. There's certain things, there's parts of a picture and someone can get stuck in their painting and or, or their sculpture or whatever. And it's like, well, there's some place you have to look and see there's something working here, some little corner. And that's how you diagnose what to do next. But usually... It's those places where those things are working, where you're not holding it so tightly. And I want to just talk to you about this because the idea of playing and fully letting go, which invites intuition in and and soul, you know, that is sort of speaks through that. Don't you think like that is what we're talking about here? Your soul isn't interested in authorship. It's channeling it's channeling a much bigger force that is collective. It's the field. I think that is the secret weapon of art making, honestly. And life making, right? Because this is what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. The introduction to the alchemy deck that comes out this summer, the guidebook is a kind of homage to my first drawing teacher who we've been speaking about. And she was about in her seventies when I met her. And 
I was with her at the end of her life. The introduction's all about that kind of moment of her in the hospital when she passes and the, the, that, that experience. But she was such a disciplinarian and so you could say rigid in a lot of ways about her approach at the same time when she would sometimes see us in the cafeteria, cause it was a, a boarding art school, uh, she would see us in the cafeteria. If you're eating ice cream or whatever, she'd say, Ooh, the secrets are in the ice cream. Are you playing with the ice cream? Like she always had this thing where she went back to uh-huh. the, the swoop of the swirl of chocolate and vanilla ice cream. If you observe that, you can actually f- something can click open and you're like, now I know what to do with that alabaster sculpture I've been carving for the last three months. Yes, yes, yes. I love that. So in the, in the guidebook, I have this list of things that she said, if you followed them, she promised that if you followed them daily, the rest of life, including a creative career would fall into place. One, make your bed two, eat your oatmeal three, play with your ice cream. Secrets are everywhere. Four, your tools reflect your mindset. Five, everything is alive. Six, energy is visible. Train your eyes. Seven, nature is the teacher. And eight, the truth is in the material. Oh my God, those are, wow, those are beautiful. She was very, very special. It it makes me emotional (laughs) to hear that. I'm at this business ma- mastermind right now, and uh, one of the women in it has, you know, like so many people gone through some hard stuff. And like many people, we just work, just put your head down and work, work, work. And she is finally getting to take two weeks off, which she's never done. Like it's been like 20 years. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but she, and she was just sharing this and and like saying, well, I do have to work a little. And and the way she was talking about it was that she, that this was like, it's not going to disrupt her business too much. She needs to do it because she's going to like physically break down. And 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 she's like, I just want to like sit on the lanai in, in Hawaii. She's going to Hawaii and, you know, like watch the whales. And, and it was like this sort of like, she's just going to stop, which is obviously so, so good. But I was saying to her, you know, you're in this business mastermind and you're doing all these things, but those spaces are just as in, they're like more important. This, like they're, they will actually in, you know, they're so practical. They're so needed. It's how you find your way. And, and, I, and I said, there's a tremendous amount to be learned from a whale. Right. You know, and it's like, it's really true. It's like, it's the answers are in the swirly ice cream, you know, they're, they're play with your mashed potatoes, you know? (laughs) Exactly. And that's a really specific, I don't want to call it like a mind F, but I don't know if you often curse on your show, but like, I have to go back to it all the time because I can take myself so seriously and so much pressure. And there's so much complexity right now around who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be doing and all the, all the facets of life. And then going back again and again to the teaching that the secret is in the ice cream. You could stare at a whale and become enlightened or a squash. And really, if you're absolutely present with that object and its shapes, there's so much teaching there. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, it's just a squash. At the yeah. same time, it's just yeah. a freaking yeah. squash. <laughs> Which is just like what you're talking about. Like, yeah, it's just a, those compelling images are, it's just a picture of, you know, a vessel. It's a cup, but it's also container and there's what's in it and there was what's outside of it. And it can hold the world or it can hold nothing or it can be turned upside down. And, you know, like, yep. and, it, and it's just a picture of a cup. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, an artist when just she just returned from working with orangutans in Indonesia she or no i think yeah i think it was in indonesia she signed up for this thing to like just go have this experience and i ran into her the other day and i said you know what like what okay i only have a couple of minutes like what tell me like what's the takeaway and and she said well 
oh my God, oh my God, these orangutans. First of all, no one had been there for a couple of years in the forest with them that was white because um, their traveling was shut down and this program had stopped. So you go there and you do research and you help. It's a really hard work. It's not a glamorous thing. She actually paid to go and stuff, but it's not a tourist thing. But she said, when you meet an orangutan, the gaze is so indescribably present they just look right through you. It's so direct. She, and she's like, I couldn't sleep at night. It was so powerful, the way they can just meet you. And that was the big thing that she, like it changed her, you know, this wow. experience. And, and then she learned that the Indonesian language doesn't have a past or a future tense, that this this presence is sort of embroiled in 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 the collective community and in, in, in the, I just think that's so fascinating, but it's about being present and it's what brings the juice and the energy to, to everything. The simplest thing, your mashed potatoes or being with someone or being with your art, you know? Wow. I can't believe that the no past or, or future language. Uh, Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That, that's what she said. Yeah. That's, it, right. Because really, what all what's important is now, and so what are we doing? <laughs> worrying about, you know, yeah. worrying about what where, where we haven't arrived, you know. Wow. This podcast is turning out to be, and I it was my hunch when I started it. It's about the journey. It's about finding our way, and I know this is partly what you're interested in and how you're, you know, navigating and. Your book that I read, Blossoms and Bones, you know, that's a personal journey and a challenging time in your life. But can you speak about, you know, the pivot or the realization dropping into what's truthful in the present was a portal for you? Can, can you speak about just how truth? Yes, I will. I will try. It's such a good question. I mean, I, if we stay with this thread of like, where is their energy? There's definitely energy and truth, and you can recognize it because when people start telling the truth, you know, people's heads will lift and, and yeah. they're in the room and they're like, oh, wait, someone's actually saying something real, you know? And so that has its own kind of power, being honest about uh, what is. And so I, while experiencing a sort of midlife new eating disorder experience for uh yeah it was about like a year a, a year and a half or so post divorce and and post uh several pregnancies that ended in in miscarriage all those things happened kind of consecutively and i found myself suddenly all of the control i wanted to have over my life that i couldn't have control over started to manifest itself in trying to control my physical appearance and my diet. So that wrench got tightened very, very tight. And as it tightened, a full on eating disorder ensued. So I noticed as like an observer of energy, holy shit, this thing has incredible energy. Talk about compelling. I suddenly went from a person going, going on my life, doing my thing to you know, the calorie counting and water fasting and obsessing about keto grams and every Google searching every single thing I was either putting in my body or keeping from putting in my body. Oh my God. And I thought like, oh, holy shit, this is, there is some energy here and I can't master it with all the techniques that I have in my toolbox over the years of spiritual practice and psychotherapy, all the stuff. I can't match it. it, has too much force. And so at some point, instead of, you know, really harming myself more and more in trying to beat it, because that's what, that's what we're all doing with addictions. We're trying to, we're trying to beat the energy. Uh, yeah, that's such a great way to put it. Yeah, I never thought of it that it's way. It's a yeah. funny way of framing it. Yeah, but like we're trying and then we we're hurt trying. ourselves. We hurt ourselves so. trying. Right. Yeah. So I just, at some point was like, okay, if I'm a student of energy, I'm going to study this energy. I'm going to go 
to this place that I know is kind of a safe container, which was an ashram that I had been to over the years. And I'm going to study this energy. I'm going to, you know, in the book, I call it like draw the feeling. I'm going to tap into the feeling and draw from that place, from that energy. And this was after studying Jungian psychology where, you know, there's often this idea that the shadow has incredible energy. It's co- so compelling that there's something there that wants to be known. It has a kind of intelligence that is helpful. So there is a tendency to want to just shut down and negate and get away from the energy, but that just wasn't working for me. Believe me, I was trying. Yeah, because it, I love that you've, you know, I, I think of it as the wound almost in the deepest sense that there's an intelligence. I've been doing a lot of work around this personally, uh, understanding my own shadow and wound and daylighting it and going into it as hard as that is. But I love that. I love how you describe it. And I just, I was so, it was so cool how you wrote about it and how you pictured it. You know, you told the story of it and you illustrated that looking in, but I love that you just trusted creativity to, you just drew your way towards that knowing somehow. It's so amazing. I mean, it's the only thing I, I realize how like kind of fucked up it is to say this, but I'm like, it's the only thing that's really been there for me all the while. Like I trust art making more than any other thing. Yes. It's just so reliable. It's never turned, it's reared its head on me. If I'm able to be present with art making, whether it's writing or drawing, painting, piano, you know, sound make, chanting, anything, the, it gives back to me. It just gives back to me. It's very kind space. So no matter how, how kind of, you know, I'll call it like gnarly and terrifying that energy was, as soon as I was present with it and put pen to page, it starts to soften and it starts to change. And then the book emerged from that. And it's taken, you know, me on a whole nother path, that project. I never planned to to write a book about an eating disorder and recovery and spirituality. And now I'm in Los Angeles in part working on uh, adapting that to a film script. Hopefully that will be live action plus animated, the animated drawings. And you could say that that energy looking back, it had a whole plan for me. Providing you're willing to look. And, and I think this is the, the big takeaway. If we can look, if we can and stop doing all the things, trying to fix it, you know, and go into it, then there's that intelligence can guide us out. I mean, I, I had a, you know, about 10 or 15 years ago, I I lost everything, you know, my marriage and my money. And I mean, my confidence and all I had left was, was art. And I started to make art that was personal and, and just like, I'm just going to do fine art. That's how I figured it out. I just did that. And it was so powerful. It not only gave my, my energy back and I started to do my fantasy of being a fine artist, but I was, I had extra energy and I started sharing this, what you're doing, you know, you're, you're sharing what you're learning. And, and that's what, that's why I'm talking to you today. It became art to life and, and everything. But I think this art making thing, you know, when we say it's never, it's, it's never let me down. It's always there for me. It's a safe space. I mean, this is the center of who we are. It's who we all are. It's love, right? I mean, which is, you know, it's cool because as artists, we have, there it is over there. That's my art. I can go to, but I feel like what we're doing is we're going into ourselves. We're seeing that we're truly embodiment of just love and we're good, you know, despite what everyone tells us in society and we're broken and all the things. So I, I just really relate to what you're saying about, like, that's all that I really trust. I so I get that. And I think it's been super comforting for me. It's like led me down a road. And I think it's like your soul's work. It's like your purpose. It takes you to your purpose. I mean, do you feel this is your purpose, right? It it absolutely is. It has a path for me that I don't 
I can't know. My, I can't cerebrally, intellectually know. The pen to the page and the hands on the piano keys, that is, that's the path that I'm following. And it's interesting because I've studied a, many different spiritual traditions and ashrams and I kind of go deep into these different lineages and collect what kind of pollen I can, so to speak. And it, I oftentimes think, oh, this is, I finally found the place. I finally found the guru. I finally found the ashram. I finally found the mantra. I finally found the perfect thing. And at some point, the facade cracks and I see like, oh, these are a bunch of humans yes. <laughs> making a bunch of weird decisions, <laughs> yeah. trying their very best to not be humans. Uh huh. To, and repackaging it up in a way exactly. that's like, this is cool. You know, like yeah. this one comes with a really great yoga mat and the music. Yeah. So good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's maybe like a boyfriend at that one. And like, and then, uh. and, and so it, it's so alluring to me. I'm so fascinated by it. And, and in the end, it always folds back to art making for me. Artist as the sort of central force. And the different spiritual traditions, the mandalas, the images, the art world in New York, all of that spins around it as a way to s sort of study how do these systems that we think are perfect soon fall apart? They yeah. just do, whether it's the museum or the ashram. They have the same suffering going on. Ah, oh, that's so good. I love that we're talking about museums and ashrams in the same sentence. <laughs> it's like, places, <laughs> you, know? you know, and I, and, and I want so badly, I'll find the organization that really has their shit together. I'll, maybe it's the Rubin Museum of Art. You yeah, know, maybe it's them. Right. They, they just, they only show mandalas. And then, and then you dig in a little bit of like, well, who's showing it? Who's the, where's the revenue going? And yeah, who's, who's the collector here? And it does the art, want to be brought here from there and and these questions it gets so complicated yes yes i, yes. I love the rubin museum of art everyone should go there by the way it's fantastic okay but these are all these are questions and same with the guggenheim has a lot of a lot of questions about who's who's showing there and how how did that happen so I'm super envious of your, you have this music, you have this, that component to your life and your work. And uh, I, I, t tell me a little bit about that. I, I feel like someone asked me, you know, if you weren't a painter, what would you be? And it's like, oh, I'd be a, I'd be a musician. Like, I almost feel more excited by music than I do looking at paintings. I, I love painting, but what I draw, what I'm drawn to almost more for inspiration is music. So I got to hear, like, tell me, I don't, I'm not, I'm sorry. I haven't even like listened to any of your music. I wasn't even thinking about that. I, I'm, so it's piano. Do you sing? It's no problem because I haven't, I haven't put out music in 10 years. I used to be in a band with my, my ex-husband called Family Band. We have a couple of music videos that are pretty fun to watch. There's one called Moonbeams and there's one called Night Song that I did illustrations for. Okay. Night Song. It's pretty fun. You can see the link with my work in, in that video. And then when the tarot deck came out, I quit the band and I really kind of air quote that, like I quit the band and I perceived that I quit music. However, looking back, that's around the same time I started to, to learn mantra and started chanting. And so my practice with music was very, very different. It wasn't the flashy, cool indie band, you know, opening for so and so on the US tour and what have you. Our band was never big, but we, we had a couple like things happen that were really fun and it was such a cool experience. But and that was called was, Family Band? Was that the family name? Family band? band, yeah. Okay, we'll get links to that, yeah. I kind of thought of it as like a failure, you know, because it didn't go through the same trajectory as other successful quote-unquote bands mm -hmm. did. So the tarot deck came out, the tarot deck started making money, the band was taking all the money, filling the gas tank, going on these U.S. tours, following these bigger bands around who were in, you know, buses, and we were in the shitty tour van. And and it, it something had to give, so I... I closed the band and really put everything I had into the wild unknown and built that brand. And, and now turns out, you know, years later, there's these melodies, there's these melodies inside me that they want to be 
sung and they want to be shared. And I feel really blessed to have started playing the piano again during quarantine. And as awkward and insecure and cumbersome it all was to get back into that, I did it. I just slowly kept playing, making sounds. Yeah. And then I, last December, started working with a producer out here in L.A., and thankfully he just had a, a sensibility around him that very sensitive to sound and more of like a, a spiritual sense and, you know, Alice Coltrane kind of uh, fan. And Mantra, we wove Mantra in and out of the record, and it's it's I'm so proud of it. I don't know what will happen with it. I we're just working on final mixes and who knows. Wow, that's so cool. You actually cut an album. I mean, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. But I mean, that's like an assignment, you know, it's like a tarot deck. It's like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know things are like 12 songs, but I mean, you you did a series of songs or melodies and put them together. What's the album or collection going to be called? I believe it's going to be called Mirror, Mirror. Wow. And so I just, you know, if there's anyone like listening that has projects that they've shut the door on, I shut the door on that project very hard. The, to me, there's always something suspect about when I slam doors, you know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not a musician and I quit the band. And it's like, hmm, really? It'd be different yes. if I was like, oh, I play music sometimes, it's not a big deal. But there was some sort of energy there that was like, close that door. There's too mm -hmm. much there's too much there. Well, even the name is a little tiresome. The family band. It's I don't picture you in the family band. I mean, that's just no, the name is wrong. Name. It was, it's, it's, it's it was just, the wrong no, name. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And you said your ex husband was a member of it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that gets harder too, maybe. You know, like I see you as a singular force. Maybe collaborating was, some, but you. It was definitely intense, uh, the power dynamic. I wasn't quite ready to step into being the leader of the band, even though I was writing all of the songs and, pay, you know, putting gas in the tank and making the music videos and all that stuff. I, I wasn't at a confident enough place to say, like, this is my project. Do you guys want to be part of it? Because I was very, very insecure of what I had to offer as a musician because I'm not trained as a musician. And I was a, a woman am, amongst many dudes in the, in the recording studio and in, in on the, yeah. on the tour. And so my, my insecurity really was uh, a mega component of that project. And that has been a really big sort of teaching for me going back into the studio and finding confidence in not being an expert, not being trained. Like with drawing, I can say I've been drawing almost every day since I was 15 and no one can fuck with me about that. You know, I'm kind yeah, of like, right, right. I put That's, that out there. Like for me too. I'm like, I've, I've stood in front of paintings more longer than most people. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Like yeah. I've stood there and I don't know if I learned anything, but I have stood there longer than you. Yeah, and that's exactly. why my art's probably maybe better or at least a, it's, <laughs> I got something to say, you know, I mean, yeah, I can't do that with music. I'm like, okay, I know these chords on the piano and I'm very aware of the time I have not spent on the piano. <laughs> oh my God. So at the same time, I can show up and be present and sing and write and play as I can today. Otherwise I would never do it. Yes. So tell me, how does it connect? Like when you're making the sounds, is it the same thing? Like, oh, that's... It's well, it's sequence of sounds, just like art making. It's a sequence of movements and gestures and marks and different emotions that feel correct intuitively. I mean, is that how you're making your music? Like you make your drawings or? I think for me, it almost came out of a limitation from the drawings. I want the drawings to do more than they can as a two dimensional thing at this point. I want them to move and I want them to make sound. That's one reason why I'm interested in getting Blossoms and Bones into onto the big screen. But it's also something that happens in the body with resonance that the drawings, no matter how I try, I can't get them to do that, to have that felt resonance, the felt experience. So I think music was almost 
returning to music came out of a frustration with what I couldn't get to with the drawings. Mm -hmm. And the content's the same. The songs are super trippy and esoteric and the, the, you know, half of them are to the planets and half of them are about archetypes. They're just lists yeah, of archetypes, right. like literally <laughs> like listing all the words from the different yeah. projects. Yeah. Well, you could almost like your playlist could be your, your teacher's, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. seven points. Like that's, those are great song titles, by the way, you know, exactly. So I think you know, those that know my work will definitely see like the, the consistency of tone or theme. But I, I hope that this is a, uh, sort of world that you can get into almost like casting a sort of sonic spell or opening up a, a sonic space that has a sort of, I love that, uh, reverence. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mystery and blessing inside of the sound. That's what I was going for. Yeah, like this portal of mystery and wonder and ah, so good. Wow, man. I just, uh, what a remarkable life you're living. I mean, are you, Thanks. you know, like, I mean, it's just, it's, I love, and, and, you know, all the right moves I've made and all the cool things that I've experienced have always come out of just this. I don't know. I don't know why I decided to turn left instead of right. And, you know, but it's like you get that there's the, this inner pilot light that if you can tap into it, it's super, super powerful in, in guiding, you know. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Can you just really like, you know, we got there's so much I want to talk to you about, but I this idea of synchronicity and, and the field and, you know, where you are spending most of your time and and how you're informing people and the guidance. And in a way, it relates to the tarot deck again, you know, that we're reminded of things or we're present with things or when we're more present, we notice more and there's things that come across our paths that that are perfectly timed, that are appropriate, that are right. I mean, I can imagine you are really experiencing this in your life a lot. And I know when I'm more present and more in a flow state, this happens to me. Can, can you talk about just synchronicity and what, what you think about that and how you describe that? I'm, I'm always trying to describe this to, to people in my programs and I, and I don't really know how to talk about it so well, but it's a force that, that, that it's so cool. It's so powerful and is so helpful. It's such a big topic. All I can say is it doesn't look like what I think it should look like. It doesn't look like what I prescribe it to look like. You know, synchronicity, well, I'll, I'll just say from personal experience. In my transition out here to Los Angeles, I was very confused just in New York for COVID, single during COVID, very strange time. I did IVF. Should I implant the embryo? Am I going to go through this pregnancy as a single mother by choice? Like all this, all these questions. Mm. Mm -hmm. I do want to ex accept your, your gracious words around my life being <laughs> very full and, and exciting and creative. At the same time, there's these areas that I feel, um, and I'm sure some listeners feel there's like a no fly zone for that same type of synchronicity. It's like, yeah, these areas, I got that. But in here, there's no way synchronicity could, could be here. Yeah. This is a blind, this is a no fly zone for synchronicity. No, 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 absolutely. And I have those areas in my life too, where I'm much less trusting. So what I did with my move out here and all of the swirling thoughts and the confusion around where am I living? How old am I when the pregnancy, all this stuff, partner, you know? Yeah. How will I find all of these things? And I just kept seeing the image of the piano. That's all I saw. Talk about compelling image. God. All I could see clearly was the image of the piano. And so I just said to myself, follow the piano. That's what I'm doing. And that's what I tell my friends. And thankfully my, my parents, you know, they're, they're, they're tolerable of these things by now. So they're just saying, okay, we trust you, you know, can do, we've seen you <laughs> make these types of choices before. So yeah, um, right. we believe in you. 
I, I thought they might say, you know, listen, well, we have a really nice piano downstairs. I, Does that mean you're coming home finally? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I did. I found a rental. As soon as I saw the photograph of the piano in the space, I knew that I needed to be in the space for uh, a couple of months. So I came out here and I just followed the piano. I... I've been at, at this place for a few months now and I play, you know, a, as many hours a day as I can. And I don't need to solve the, if I can loop this back to synchronicity, I don't need to solve cognitively those other quote unquote problems in my life. Mm -hmm. If I follow the symbol or image that is coming up strongly for me, it will guide the way. So I know if I am following the piano, the sounds that it makes, the thing that it, it ignites in me, that the partner, the potential family, the home, whatever is next will come about. Those aren't things that I'm willing to at this point, like Google search and try to find solutions for anymore. Right, right, right. I love it. I went to an apartment this morning and I thought, okay, well, this place is month to month. I need to find like a actual place. And I went to this apartment. It was great. It was great. An old me would have gotten, would be now after this podcast, putting my application in and crossing my fingers. And I drove home and I just said over and over in my mind, follow the piano, follow the piano. What do you, what wants to happen? And it was like, that's not the apartment for you. Stay where you are. Stay with the piano until the next thing is clear. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm now willing to wait. What's the synchronicity that's going to... I'm not going to it. It's coming to me. Yes. Because yes. I'm staying with this piano. I followed the piano here and I'm sitting at it every day. So something's going to come to me because I'm already stepping forward to it. And when that occurs, I will be signaled. And then the next step can occur because when I start Google searching stuff and when I spend a long time on like, you know, West side apartment rentals, the part of me that is very much aligned with my life path and destiny and, and trusting that is just dissolved in like six or seven minutes. <laughs> like, yes, well, yes. this place looks like, you know, right. You try Well, work. yeah, it's like the exhaustion <laughs> of, imagining you're, you know, here's a recipe to have a bad day. Try to picture these places and really, really imagine living in that space. You know, like I'm talking to you from, from Nashville and I'm in this Dolly Parton um, bedroom, which is actually kind of perfect for this conversation. And, um, but it's not where I want, it's not where I'm going to thrive, but there's something that's really correct about it. You know, I've never, it's hilarious. Um, but yeah. How long have you been there for? Uh, I'll be I've, like, I'll be here five or six days. I've been here a few days. Um, you know, so and most of the Dolly time. Parton. Like, it's a lot of Dolly Parton, but this whole place is kind of like Dolly Parton, Dolly Parton. It's crazy. I could talk to you forever. I'm curious Obviously, just if you can share with me like what you're super, super excited about coming up, I guess it's it's turning this amazing uh, Blossoms and Bones book into a film. I mean, oh my God, that's so cool. But is is there, what is coming that you're really excited about? Just maybe that or whatever else, or just, are you staying on the West Coast or? I'm staying on the West Coast. So I'm excited about that new adventure and the two projects that brought me out here, which are Blossoms and Bones, my co-writer on that script. And just seeing where that goes, I've never worked on a film before and just getting it made is like so hard. I've, I'm so DIY my whole life. I thought I'm not going to wait for a publisher to believe that tarot can be popular. It was 2012. I thought yeah. I'm going to just print it myself. I don't like waiting around for the people and their marketing teams. They, they, yes. they get very sleepy. And, yes. Yes. And so the movie making is really challenging for me because I have, I just have to wait. And keep working and well, there's all these hands involved now too. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I so literally can't thing. do it myself. So <laughs> right, it's a it's a big learning curve. And then the the record is I'm just so excited about it. I'm just conceptualizing the music videos now. Oh my god, oh my god, that's right. You got to do music video. Wait, there it is. That's it. Yeah, you do the album for the music videos. I mean, putting imagery, movement, imagery, and words. Wow, so fun. 
so fun. Talk god. about playing with ice cream. It's like yes, it's, it's here. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, Kim, thank you so much. And, um, uh, you know, we're going to, I'm going to s- track down all the links for this and share, put them on the, you know, on, on our, our site. So people can find all about you is, so your album's not out yet, but is there like a, a mailing list or anything you want people to do or follow or if they follow me on my personal Insta, Kim underscore Kranz, then okay, they'll we'll pr- be, provide that. yeah, they will be, um, tuned in to when the record comes out and as the music videos come out so yeah awesome and the alchemy deck comes out in july um, which is the fourth and final of the wild unknown so that that feels like a beautiful completion to that project mm. it gives me a lot of freedom so excited okay well listen thank you so much thank you so much hey thanks for listening to the art to life show if you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolivepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.